again, good morning to everybody. Last night was a tough night for all of us, I think, in Pittsburgh, especially in our diocese here. I don't think any of us were uh, hoping for where we are right now, but I know that it's through these uh, challenges and crosses that we can be more united to Jesus than ever before. Last night, as we were sharing the news from our bishop, the different suppression modes going on now because of the coronavirus and because of uh, some priests perhaps uh, getting tested now for coronavirus. Extreme measures have been putting in place, which really unprecedented. I, I would imagine that only under like communist China, Nazi Germany, and uh, some of those awful regimes like Stalin and Russia has mass adoration, the celebration of the sacraments, have all been suspended. And as we were discussing this amongst priests and just praying about this last night, I looked over to the one priest and I could tell his eyes were just ready to just burst with tears. And so he just got up and went out to the porch and just wept. And we sat in silence for a couple minutes looking at each other and none of us ever thought it would come to this. And I don't know where you are in terms of how you've dealt with these days or how you feel right now. But I can say that weeping is probably a really good thing to do. In fact, in the Gospel, Jesus weeps three times. In each of those times are moments where the tragedy of, of seeing what was coming seeing his people suffer or abandon him cause his human nature to provoke in his divine nature this tremendous outpouring of sorrow, of suffering, and of tears. And so obviously one of the first times that we see Jesus crying is when he looks over Jerusalem. There's a beautiful place in Jerusalem if you've ever been there. Uh, it's called Dominus Flavit, which it's this moment where it's as if Jesus rises above Jerusalem and his tears are like clouds of rain just pouring down on Jerusalem as he realizes the very religious leadership, the very religion, the very people that were his father's people that he nurtured from the time definitely throughout scripture that you can see him. And he would use all these tender images in the Old Testament as a, a hen, you know, uh, hovers over her little chickadees. And, and you can see over and over again as a husband would love his wife. And all these incredible, mystical experiences of, of his people with God and the very religious leaders of his time. When the moment was most critical, the Savior, this is what everything pointed to from Adam and Eve, through Moses, through David, through John the Baptist. And Jesus comes to, to bring his people into the fullness of, of God. And he looks at the religious leaders. He looks at the place, the very center of where the Jewish faith was supposedly going to um, be able to come and show the world the true worship. And what does Jesus see? He sees the immorality of his religious leaders. He sees the people falling into pagan ways. He sees those who are entrusted with the sacred scriptures, those who are entrusted with the Ark of the Covenant, those who are entrusted with God's greatest mysteries, abusing it and using it, and falling into fear and trembling, so that fidelity to God was no longer their number one thing. It was fitting in with the rest of the world. It was no longer upholding the sacredness and bowing before the sacredness, it was now kneeling down and worshiping mammon. It was no longer letting God be the one that directs their lives, but now it was the world. We hear Jesus say, those who walk in darkness stumble, and those who walk in the light see the light. Jesus was the light, and they chose darkness. And if you look through Scripture, it's interesting, like, as we're coming up to Holy Week now, Look at how in John's gospel, light and darkness are constantly contrasted. Jesus, at the very apex of the Last Supper, talks about the offering of his very life for us. 
And then it says, Judas turned into the darkness and left. And, and John just simply comments, it was the night. Jesus cries over Jerusalem because the very leadership that he had, his father had put into place to lead his people to the fullness of a relationship with, with God. And now it was the time they abandoned him. And so it is today that we too need to have the courage, those who have been called into the family of God, especially those of us who are Catholics, who have the fullness of the faith. This is our time. This is our moment where we can take the tears of Jesus and let them flow through our hearts, mixing them with our tears, so that the people around us feel hope that the world that seems to be covered in coronavirus is covered with the crown of Christ and the very blood of Christ that wants to flow through his heart to ours can reach to the very um, depths of humanity that is so crying out today for the hope of Christ and God. Obviously, the other time that Jesus weeps is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And how can you not think of that Caravaggio-esque beginning to the Passion of Christ, the, the movie, which Jim Caviezel plays Jesus and Mel Gibson directs. And I guess if there was one thing, well, not one thing, but a thing to consider during these days would be to watch that movie, to contemplate how passionately Jesus spills out his his blood on the wall for us, knowing that today we would miss him more than ever because we can't receive him in the Eucharist, we can't baptize, we can't do all these sacraments, they're all suspended, we can't even come to the Eucharistic adoration. And so Jesus weeps. He weeps on the ground of the Garden of Gethsemane, seemingly putting in the water of divine love that one day before, thousands of years before, it was the spittle of God that mixed with clay that created Adam and Eve. And now what does Jesus do? He weeps in the garden of Gethsemane and says he's going to make all things new. And so he takes our dust, our dirt. Remember just a couple of weeks ago at Ash Wednesday, we were told that on the dust it will return. We are that dust without Jesus. And so we need his tears to mix with ours so as to recognize how hopeful we can be, not because the circumstances around are easy, not because the coronavirus will get cured, but because we weep with Jesus, who is the ultimate victor in all this. And isn't it ironic, the gospel that we just read the third time, that, that Jesus uh, weeps? He's told of his friends, Lazarus, and then danger of death. And Jesus seemingly postpones his arrival to, Jesus, to, to, to Lazarus. And it's in that postponement that all of us can wonder as Martha wondered, if only you had been here. Mary wonders the same thing. Both sisters say the same thing when they see Jesus. Lazarus had died Jesus seemed to be postponing his presence, and both the sisters conclude, if only you would have been here. And maybe that's how we feel. It's like, if only I could go to Mass today, if only I could do adoration. Uh, you know, I, I just went down the street here to this dear family that's from Honduras, and you see that just the, the, their home and, and, and how difficult they live in, it, like two or three rooms, and these beautiful little girls, and they wanted to be baptized. And we were going to do a baptism, and we're going to have to hold off on that. And we, I just think about this dear mother, her name's Clardy, and how her heart just pours out with great love for these little girls. She lives in a country that she doesn't even understand the language. She misinterpreted the suppression laws, thinking that she wasn't even allowed to go outside to get fresh air. And so, uh, dear Cindy and I, we, we walked down to their house after two weeks of them being suppressed, literally, like not even walking outside. They were just stuck in their home with their children. And uh, we said, no, no, you're allowed to walk outside. In that breath of fresh air that Jesus Christ wants to bring us in this moment of suppression, despite not being able to receive the sacraments, is exactly why Jesus, looking at Martha and Mary, looking at the Jews who were weeping, he looked at the weeping and the crying of the people around him. And then we have the, the, the shortest verse in all of John's Gospel. It's just two words. The English, unfortunately, puts three in, but there's really only two. 
Jesus wept. And it would be good for us to ask ourselves today, in my life, maybe in these present circumstances, what would cause Jesus to weep? When we look at our own heart and some of the difficulties that we've been through, maybe because we caused it, because of some disappointing decisions and actions that we made. Maybe it's because those who are dearest to us have caused us such pain. Maybe it's the current circumstances of perhaps losing a job, perhaps wondering where the next tragedy will come from. Perhaps it's losing a loved one now, knowing that there'll be no funeral mass for them. It's in that pain that we need to have the courage to simply open up our arms and let the weight of God's love hold them. It's as if we need to hold out our arms to let the weight of God's love to come down on them. It's as if we need to somehow be able to unite our tears with the tears of Jesus because it's in our tears that he can flow down onto us and be in us in ways that perhaps we've never thought before, but when we look back at our history and we look at where we are, we need to go to those tears and unite those tears to the very tears of Jesus Christ. It's in crying with Christ. It's being real with Christ. It's not pretending that this is easy or it's that, oh, we've done this before, we can do that. No, it's taking that pain and that suffering and uniting it to Jesus Christ. It's so beautiful here in just a couple of minutes. You'll see Deacon Tony take that little droplet of water and put it into that the wine and you can just recognize how that divine wine of love wants our little droplet of pain and suffering, our tears, to mix with his so that our humanity can be mixed with his divinity. So I pray and hope that all of us who are walking together in this valley of tears, as the prayer says, that we can unite our tears to that of Jesus Christ and know that we have a God, unlike other religions, that actually enters into our weeping to cry with us, to be with us, not to leave us there, but to give us the ultimate victory over whatever it is that we're suffering. You know, it's interesting, the Jews had this way of caring for the dead that was different. Um, you know, the Egyptians would embalm the bodies when they would die so that perhaps they would be preserved, so to speak. And the, uh, the Jews, what they would do is take the body, as you could imagine with Lazarus, and place them in this kind of temporary tomb. It was about a year or so that the bodies would be allowed to be in these kind of tomb-hewed places, like when Jesus rose from the dead, and they put a rock over it, and yet the stench would have been really bad after a couple of days. But they believed that the soul would leave after about three days. So four days in, not only did it stink, but you could really say that um, Lazarus was dead. Not like that movie where they're saying mostly dead. No, but like, like Lazarus was really dead. There isn't like this mostly dead or nearly dead. It's he was dead. And so Jesus, and so the Jews, what they would do is a year later, after the flesh and the skin would be completely decayed and there would only be bones, they would collect these bones and then take them to a place where these relics would be stored. You can hear about this with Joseph uh, in the Old Testament, that he asked that, uh, his brothers that when he died, that they would take his bones back to the Holy Land, the Promised Land. And so I think it was 800 years later, after Joseph's death, they took his bones, his relics, to the Holy Land uh, with them. And so I say this because in Ezekiel you can hear it, in the bells that are ringing now you can hear it, in our own lives we can hear it. That it seems like death, darkness, depression could be stronger than life, than hope, and resurrection. And so Jesus could have cured Lazarus he could have easily prayed and had never had Lazarus die. 
but he didn't want to show that he had power just over the human illnesses, that he could cure coronavirus. But instead, what does he want to show? That on this earth is a time to allow our tears to unite to his, so that we can achieve the ultimate goal of our life, which is to live eternally with Jesus Christ. And so, rather than curing Lazarus, he raises him from the dead, so as to show us the ultimate sacrifice of our lives, which would be death. United to Jesus's, gives us the greatest hope in the world. So no matter what conclusion we hold from this coronavirus time, the worst in types of fears, and even death itself, are conquered with Jesus, which is why next week we won't have palms for Palm Sunday. I would suggest that we wave our biblical terrible towels, you have a real terrible towel, and recognize that the victory of Christianity is wrapped up and twirling the ultimate terrible towel, which is the hope in Jesus Christ victory in each one of our hearts, minds, and souls. And so let us pray today, united through this very simple means, that however we feel, we can take that to Jesus and allow him to cry with us and give us the hope of eternal life.